Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Reactor 6 tutorial series. I'm going to spend an episode today talking about the interface because I don't think it's the most friendly and there's quite a lot of almost hidden features in it that really help us to navigate our way around and make this thing a lot more usable. So I think it's really worth getting some of that stuff under our fingers right at the outset. In the first episode, we started over in the player tab and I briefly described uh, the fact that it's a mix of racks and ensembles, but I didn't really double down on the concept. The reason this tab is called player is because everything about this folder is to do with the musical instruments that are the end result of a reactor session. So here we've got um, a preset loaded. This is one of the racks from the block space folder. This happens to be um, a keyboard oriented um, instrument. But there are lots of other um, instruments that are sequence based. So if we go to the soundscape folder, for instance, and drag one of these in, now this thing is up and running without me doing a single thing. I've not pressed any keys on the keyboard. Let's have a look at another one. This is gonna be a sequence based preset. So if I press play, now it's gonna play something. If I press a key on the keyboard, don't get anything at all. If we press play again, and press different notes on the keyboard, the keyboard is interacting with the sequence. So depending on what kind of musical instrument you're talking about, it's a very context-based environment. The fact is that they're all players, they're all instruments, musical instruments, that's why it's called player. Now that situation is slightly confused in the blocks world because the player tab also gives you access to blocks. So here we have an instrument, it's called Source of Uncertainty, it produces the sound you just heard. But if I head over into the blocks folder and start dragging stuff into this instrument, I'm changing it, I'm adding components to this musical instrument. I can reroute it, I can get rid of some of these cables. I can fundamentally alter how this instrument works. Now I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of that feature being in the player tab, because as far as I'm concerned, that's internal configuration of the instrument itself. But this is that strange kind of twilight zone that blocks live in, that they're part instrument, part module. What I recommend that you get into the habit of doing is you start off in the player tab and you get the rack up and running that's going to be the basis for the, for the instrument that you ultimately want to create. Once you're there, switch over to the library tab and this gives you a pared down blocks only view of the reactor world. So all of the same blocks that we just saw earlier over in the player tab, here's the block space folder. If we open that, you can still see exactly the same components. We can drag them across in exactly the same way, but now you can only see blocks. So all of those, those presets, those instruments that you can theoretically load into reactor as a starting point, they're all gone now, we can't see them. We can only see the blocks. And of course, when you're building a blocks-based instrument, that's all you want to be able to see. So it's really useful to get into the habit of switching between these two tabs as required. As far as the user folders are concerned, there's nothing in the library tab that we're currently interested in because this is for if you're building your own blocks. Now we're nowhere near that yet. We're using this thing as basically a modular wall. The reactor gives us the components and we use those components to build to make music. So we're not interested in the user folder in the library tab. We are, of course, interested in the user folder of the player tab because this is where we store our user racks. Now, if you have a look in the racks folder, I've cleaned it up a little bit and I've created this preset called 002 oscillator with envelope. I'll just drag that into the interface. And this is a standard that I'm gonna develop throughout this video series. The three digit number is gonna represent the episode number of this series. So this is episode number two, and then a brief description of what the thing is. This is the simplest possible keyboard based rack I could think to build. And we'll use this rack and others um, in later episodes to help us basically put these things together and, and build real world instruments. Any of these pre uh, rack presets that I build as part of this series, I'll make available to my patrons and YouTube channel members. If you wanna check out the links below, it's an awesome way to help support me. So here I was in my user folder, dragging my preset rack in. Now that I've got my rack in place, immediately jump over to the library folder, uh, switch back to the factory view because that's where all of the blocks live and I'm good to go. 
Okay, let's start having a closer look at this rack and see what useful stuff we can glean from an interface perspective. Firstly, let's have a look at the cables. At the moment, they're all gray. This means that I haven't designated them as doing a particular job, but there is um, a standard as part of the NKS um, protocol, and it's just a convention, but it's one that's very closely adhered to. There are four different primary color types of the cables that we use. If I jump uh, briefly back to one of the preset racks and just pull one in quickly, you might not have even noticed, it might not have registered to you that there are four different kinds of cable colors here. We've got red, purple, blue, and teal. The blue is a cyan, but we'll call it blue because the convention does. Red is pitch, um, purple is audio, blue is modulation, and teal is clocks, gates, and triggers. So let's deal with each one of those in turn. I'm going to reload my really simple rack, head back into file, recent files, and here it is. And we're gonna use this preset to make sense of those four color terms and really start to understand you know, how all of this stuff plugs together. Let's deal with pitch first. So as you can see, out of the note in block, we have a port called pitch. It's connected into an oscillator and that's pretty much where the pitch story ends. So we need to define and understand what that signal is really representing. What I'm gonna do is take a second output from the note in block, and I'm gonna plug it into this fabulous module called Util Scope. This is your very best friend, and you should basically have a scope in use all the time in all of the modular um, racks that you build. It's found in the blocks base uh, Util folder. Here it is, Util Scope. Now the visible view in this scope can be synced in multiple different ways. We're not gonna worry desperately about exactly what that means, except to say that free is the simplest. Basically this oscilloscope is constantly reading the input signal and it's representing that information back to us in real time. I'm also gonna make its time-based measurement something a little bit more meaningful to us. I'm gonna say it redraws this view every half a second. Other than that, let's not worry about it anymore. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start pressing keys on my keyboard. So here's the lowest key on my keyboard. And now as I start traveling up, you can see that control voltage get higher and higher. And there's my top key. Every one of those values is greater than zero and less than one. It doesn't matter what the number is. It's just that pitch is such a universal and important feature, you know, in, in terms of our understanding of music that they've been locked down to these absolute discrete values. So if I press a middle C, here's 261 Hertz. That's the control voltage represented by that middle C output. So anything that's dealing in pitch signals, so let's say just completely for argument's sake that that's 0.56347. It doesn't matter what the number is, we're gonna color it red. So this little cable heading out of the note in block into the pitch block, I'm gonna right click on it. I'm gonna say color red and that's that done. Okay, what's the second category of color we have to deal with? Well, purple represents audio. Oscillators generate audio, so the signal coming out of it is an audio signal. Let's have a look at what that looks like in the scope. So if I drop this cable, if I pick this cable up and drop it into the input, the old cable will be thrown away. So outputs can have any number of uh, cables connected to them. Inputs can only ever have one. So if I drop this in place, the old cable gets thrown away. Now you can see what an audio signal looks like. And this is where the refresh rate of our oscilloscope is important. Now, if you remember, the last key that I pressed on this keyboard was middle C. Here's our 261 Hertz um, handily represented in the external tuner. So this is outside reactor. This is just basically observing the total sum output of this instrument. There's our 261 Hertz. If I zoom in, to the point where I can only see a small number of waves. It's really confusing. You can see this thing is strobing constantly. So we're gonna switch sync mode to Z cross. This is zero cross. So what the oscilloscope is now doing is identifying the point in this output 
where the signal, the control voltage signal is at zero. And when it finds this consistent value, all of these points here that I'm pointing to with my mouse, they're all at zero. And the oscilloscope basically calibrates itself to that. And so it can represent a more stable or more fixed vision. So now we can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six complete waves plus a little bit in this um, oscilloscope view. Well, we can start doing some pretty easy maths on this now. If I pull up a calculator, the entirety of this scope output represents 24.4 milliseconds of time. Well, if we got 1000 milliseconds to start with, which is a second, and we divide it by 24.4, that's how many times this, um, this view is refreshing in a single second. Now we can see that there are about six and a fifth, let's say 6.2 waves in this particular view. So if it's drawing 6.2 waves, 41 times a second times 6.2, we get 254. Because I used very rough approximations there in my calculations, I was eight digits out from the number I should have actually arrived at, which was 261.62. This is the actual number and my super rough approximation with masses of errors got me really, really close to the answer. So this scope is genuinely representing every single one of those 261 uh, oscillations per second that this sawtooth oscillator is generating. So Z cross is great when you're looking at audio signals. So now we've got a much better understanding of what it means when we're talking about audio signals. So this cable coming out of the oscilloscope into the VCA wants to be colored purple. It's an audio output. Furthermore, that audio cable is gonna travel through the amplifier to the outside world. So both of these cables are also audio outputs coming out of our level meter. Both of these cables are gonna be um, audio outputs as well. So all four of these cables want to be purple. Let's do that in one shot. I'm gonna press the control key down on my keyboard and now start single clicking cables. You can see as I single click them, they turn pink. Pink means selected. So it's not basically, it's not describing the type of cable, it's describing that it's been selected. So control, click, now selected all four of those cables. Right click, color, purple, job's done. The next of the color conventions that we deal with for cables is um, teal, which is like a greeny kind of color. And this deals with clocks, gates, and triggers. So what we're talking about here is instructional signals, something that happens inside the, uh, inside the engine to say, do something right now, or start doing something, keep something open, stop doing something. Now, the difference between a gate and a trigger is simply that a gate says open, hold the gate open, close. A trigger is just a ha do something immediately. It's like a gate with no further instructions. A clock is simply something that's periodic. Tick, 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 tick. It could be trigger, 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 or gate open, close, gate open, close, gate open, close. All of these, um, all of these signals are wrapped up into a family. Now coming out of our note on um, module, we have this command called gate. So this is saying to our envelope block down here, we're gonna deal with all of these modules in very great detail in later episodes. At the moment, I'm just giving you a very kind of brief overview. This cable coming out of here is periodically saying, do something. Every time I press a key on the keyboard, there's a signal coming out of this gate. It's traveling into the envelope and it's basically making this envelope perform a command. What it's actually doing is allowing us to hear the sound. Have a look at the VCA knob every time I press a key. See that arrow around the outside? That's the amplifier being turned up every time I press a key. And it's this module here that's doing that job. This cable represents that gate that gets opened, the sound flows through, and when I let the key go, the gate closes again. Let's color it teal. Okay, we've just got one cable left to deal with.
This is connected from the output port of the envelope into the input port of the amplifier, the voltage controlled amplifier. This is probably the most complicated of the cables that we have to deal with today, but it's not rocket science. It's just, it requires a little bit of understanding. This is the cable that says to the amplifier, when there's a signal coming out of this module, turn the volume up. On, when I'm pressing a key down. When I let the key go, there's a little bit of release. In other words, the sound doesn't uh, stop immediately. It tails away more gradually. If I turn the release all the way down, now it really is on, off. As opposed to, if I double click, the release in its default position is in the middle, on, make the release a bit longer, and now it's really obvious what it's doing. So this cable here is what's performing that command, opening the amplifier, closing it again, open, close. So this is a modulation cable, it's it's a cable that represents a change being applied from one component to another in the system. In, in, in this particular case, the envelope is modulating the amplifier by turning it up and then turning it back down again. If this is a modulation cable, we want to call it blue. So all of the cables in this rack now conform to the native control standard they don't have to. When you're designing your own rack, if you have no intention of publishing this to the outside world, leave them all grey. Colour them whatever colour you like. You've got other colours available to you um, in this um, context menu, as you can see. Be my guest. Colour all of your cables yellow if you like. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't have any functional impact on the rack. But if you can get into the habit of using the cable colouring, then it can be a really nice kind of visual aid uh, when you're designing your racks. I try to be better than I actually am. You know, I would like to be perfect with my cable colouring, but sometimes I forget and, you know, things will go slightly awry. But over the course of this video series, I'll try very hard to conform to the standard wherever possible or appropriate. Now, as we saw earlier when we were selecting those cables uh, for editing, anything that's currently selected is pink. If you single click one of the headers of any of these modules, it auto selects all of the cables that are currently connected to that mod module. So that can be a really easy way to kind of narrow down what's this module doing, where are all of its cables going. Just bear in mind that it's now overridden the internal color of the cable, so you can't tell, for instance, that these are audio cables. As you also saw earlier, that cable that I dragged into the oscilloscope inadvertently got colored red. Well, it just happened to be the latest color that I'd used, so I've recently created a, a, a blue modulation cable, so now it's decided to call this thing blue, which is a little bit annoying actually. I wish it would default to gray. You can always override the color of any cable and set it back to default if you want. If you're trying to get to grips with what a module does, the info tips are fabulous. Make sure you've got this little I button, show info hints at the top engaged. And now basically if you hover in the title box, you'll get a description of the unit itself. If you hover over any of the controls, generally speaking, almost all controls in the modular world have some sort of help associated with them. Even the ports, if I hover over this sign port, it tells me what the output is. Cables hide ports and it's really annoying. So if I wanna see what this output port does, because there's a cable connected to it, I can't. There's usually a hotspot somewhere near, there you go, I'm just kind of next to the control, so you can usually find it, um, but it's not just a case of simply hovering over the top because the cable obscures it. Speaking of cables obscuring things, sometimes it can get a little bit cluttered and it can be difficult to read the labels of ports. You can temporarily hide all of the cables by engaging ports view instead, and now you can see all of the connections without any of the cables, much cleaner interface, and you can see that it's colored all of the ports appropriate to the cables that are connected to them. Head back into ports and wires view and the wires come back. Okay, I think that was quite a lot to absorb in one episode, we'll stop there. Hope you enjoyed the episode, please hit like if you did. I'll see you for the next one. Thanks very much for watching.